Hey, what's going on, Who That Nation? It is yours truly, TJ Jones, the host of the State of the Saints podcast. And some of you probably thought about starting your very own sports podcast. Well, let me help you out. I want to tell you a little bit about Anchor. Now, if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's an easy way to make a podcast. And it's free. You don't have to worry about paying a bunch of money each month. There are creation tools to allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so you don't have to worry about that. So it can be heard on apps like Spotify and Apple Podcasts and many, many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. So go to anchorfm.com and start your very own podcast today. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. New Orleans, we are the Saints. They can't stop us, we do what you can't. We got heart, plus we got soul. Make way for the black and gold. We made the Super Bowl, we made the Super Bowl. We're going to the Super Bowl. We're going to the, I be screaming, who that? She be screaming, who that? He be screaming, who that? You are now listening to the State of the Saints podcast. All I got to say is, who that? What's going on, who that nation? It is yours truly, TJ Jones, and welcome to the State of the Saints podcast. Uh, Wherever you're listening, whether you're listening on Spotify, iHeartRadio.com, iTunes, wherever. Thank you very much for your time. This is a podcast where we talk New Orleans Saints. And normally I would do a podcast. I normally do them, uh, probably upload them to YouTube or put them on Facebook. But we decided to do something a little bit different here at the State of the Saints podcast and just make an audio version. Uh, I know a lot of people out there have been asking me uh, to do an audio version of the State of the Saints podcast. Uh, So many people say that they listen to me, uh, you know, uh, walking or or, you know, in a gym trying to get their swole on. <laughs> and I appreciate that. I really do. Um, any, any way you're listening to it, uh, you know, I just appreciate it. But, you know, people have been telling me, you know, about doing this audio thing. And, you know, I, I just wanted to make sure that I give the people what they want. But we're still going to be talking about the New Orleans Saints. And what a good time to actually start an audio podcast. I mean, we're going into the postseason. The New Orleans Saints are the three seed. And one of the weirdest... NFL seasons I think I've seen in quite some time you have three 13 and three teams in the playoffs and one of them just so happened to be playing in a wild card round of the playoffs I mean I've never seen anything like that before in my life like honestly I had to go back and take a look to see if I ever uh, seen this happen and to be honest with you I couldn't find anything I couldn't find where there were three 13 and three teams going into the postseason but that's just the way that the, the ball bounced. Uh, the Saints had an opportunity uh, to wrap up the number one seed against the San Francisco 49ers. And unfortunately, they came out on the losing end. 48-46 um, to 46 was the score of that game. Uh, it came all the way down to the final possession. That seems to be the calling card of the San Francisco 49ers always coming down to the final second. Uh, but they end up getting the win over the New Orleans Saints inside of the Superdome. And that's the reason why the 49ers are the number one seed. Of course, they had to beat the the Seattle Seahawks. And that was kind of controversial the way they won that game. And then you have the Green Bay Packers, who, in my opinion, had one of the easiest schedules that I ever seen. I mean, honestly, I I, I cracked the joke. But in certain ways, I, I'm, I'm being honest. I feel like the Green Bay Packers are the Oklahoma Sooners of the National Football League. I mean, yeah, their, their record indicates that they're a good football team but my question is who in the heck did they play I just don't feel like they played anybody I don't feel like they've been tested and to be honest with you what I seen last week out of the Green Bay Packers just showed me that I mean they're not unstoppable I mean the the Detroit Lions took them to the limit and and almost beat them you know and they were actually a a David Blau uh, you know uh, sustained drive away from actually losing that game and getting bounced all the way down to the three seed, but uh, they were lucky enough to actually get that win. 
Uh, but the New Orleans Saints are the three seed once again, and now they take on the Minnesota Vikings. And I don't think I need to tell anybody in the Who That Nation to be to be excited about this game. I don't think I do because uh, you should be. Uh, I, I have mixed emotions about this game. In a way, I'm happy uh, that the New Orleans Saints are in the playoffs, of course. I mean, growing up in New Orleans, I mean, the playoffs and the Saints wasn't even mentioned in the same sentence. I mean, growing up in the 90s, it was just – you know, the Saints going to play 16 games and that's about it. And, you know, I go on with my life. But now over the past decade, uh, the New Orleans Saints uh, have been one of the winningest franchises in in the NFL. Um, they are number five uh, this decade in wins. And actually, you know, they're tied with the Seattle Seahawks. They gave it to the Seahawks because the Seahawks actually tied one of those games. They were 159-1 and the Saints were 160 Uh, So uh, the Seahawks got the edge on that. But the New Orleans Saints, uh, this is a huge game for them. And um, we all know about the Minneapolis miracle. I mean, they show it on TV like almost every every Sunday somewhere. Um, We all know that that game ended in heartbreaking fashion. Uh, Marcus Williams, he whiffed on the tackle uh, and Stephon Diggs ran it all the way into the end zone. And uh, that play just get played over and over again. And we in the who that nation just get depressed every time we see it. Uh, you know, but the Saints have opportunity to right the wrongs of yesteryear and get the win over the Minnesota Vikings. And everybody believes that the Saints are going to win this game, which scares the heck out of me because, you know, even though the Saints are a good football team, I just feel like when you have bulletin board material that you can put on a wall, and I'm talking about the Minnesota Vikings, it actually galvanizes the team and make them play, you know, to the best of their ability. Now, I don't want the Saints to go into this game overlooking them uh, to make sure that they are clicking on all cylinders. That is what I want out of the New Orleans Saints. I want them to be focused. The game that we saw in Week 17 versus the Carolina Panthers, even though the Carolina Panthers, in my opinion, had their bags packed. Uh, Tight end Greg Olson called out the team, talked about how bad they looked. And a lot of these guys are basically playing to try to get a contract, and other guys are just trying to put some positive stuff on tape. But – for the most part, I think they realized that their season was over and they were just trying to get out that game virtually unscathed. Uh, the New Orleans Saints did take advantage of that, which you are supposed to do if you are a good football team. You're supposed to go out there and you're supposed to impose your will on teams that aren't good. And the Saints did that. I mean, they put up 42 points. They put up 35 in the first half, the most points they put up in the first half in franchise history. Um, they went into the locker room with a 32-point lead, largest uh, you know, point differential ever, you know, in Saints history. So the Saints are still making history. Uh, for the past couple of weeks, the Saints uh, have been making history. It, it, it's amazing. Um, we start off with Drew Brees uh, becoming an NFL all-time leader in touchdown passes. Uh, we also see that Michael Thomas becomes the uh, single-season reception records uh, breaker. And now we see the Saints uh, with the, uh, you know, 32-point lead, largest lead they ever had versus a team going into the half. And finally, uh, the Saints also broke a record because uh, they put up the least amount of turnovers uh, in NFL history. Um, They only had eight turnovers the entire season. So that showed you right there that the Saints play, uh, you know, really good football. And that that really shows you why they are 13-3, and um, because they don't turn the ball over. They don't make many mistakes. Yeah, they get a, a boatload of penalties, But at the end of the day, um, they really go out there and they really don't shoot themselves in the foot by turning the ball over. But, you know, they did what they were supposed to do against the Carolina Panthers, and now they go against the Minnesota Vikings. The Minnesota Vikings, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, Monday Night Football, you know, they got embarrassed by the Green Bay Packers. They should have won that game, in my opinion. Uh, They had three turnovers in the first half, uh, but they couldn't generate any points. And it had a lot to do with the fact that Delvin Cook didn't play in that game. And we all know that Delvin Cook is going to play in this game. And uh, Delvin Cook is a difference maker. They're a completely different offense when Delvin Cook is playing. I mean, this guy's a really good running back. He can run between the tackles. He can catch out of the backfield. And, I mean, he just makes Kirk Cousins' life a lot easier. Uh, They are a team. They cannot rely solely on Kirk Cousins. Uh, They need to run the football in order to set up the play action. Kirk Cousins hasn't reached a point of his career in his career 
where he can actually just lead a team to victory, throwing the ball all over the place. He makes a lot of mistakes. Um, he falls under pressure, in my opinion. Um, if you send a blitz, um, he really just gets rattled. And um, when you put a lot of uh, a lot on his shoulders, sometimes he doesn't rise to the occasion, and that ends up hurting the Minnesota Vikings. And I think that they have a a, a question uh, that needs to be answered, you know. And the question is like, are you as good as your money indicates, Kirk Cousins? Because the Minnesota fan base are really frustrated right now. For the last couple of years, that opportunity to actually uh, win a win a game in order to get in the playoffs last season, you know, Kirk Cousins just couldn't handle up on his business. This time, they had opportunity to knock off the Green Bay Packers at home on Monday Night Football, and he just doesn't do it. And I don't even want to begin with his uh, win loss record is on Monday Night Football, zero and nine. So it just seems like he just falls under pressure. But he does have his safety blanket and Delvin Cook to come back. And they're going to try to run the football on the New Orleans Saints. Uh, the New Orleans Saints uh, have been doing a pretty good job at stopping a run over the last couple of weeks. Uh, you know, uh, they have two players that are very significant to the success of the defense went down, went on IR. I'm talking Sheldon Rankins and Marcus Davenport. But the young guys stepped up. We have Mario Edwards Jr. He stepped up. Shy Tuttle has stepped up. Uh, Carl Granderson has stepped up. Um, somebody that I'm really looking forward to to step up that has not stepped up, and I'm very disappointed in him, and that's Trey Hendrickson. I thought Trey Hendrickson started, to, started the season off really hot. I think he had like four sacks, and for, i say, about a week and a half, he was actually leading the team in sacks. And all of a sudden, uh, he had a, a neck injury, and he was out for a couple games, and um, he was part of that rotation with Marcus Davenport um, on the right side. I mean, excuse me, on the left side. And um, I, I just I just got to say, you know, I'm very disappointed at how he's been playing, man. He has not been getting pressure on the quarterback. Uh, the younger guys have really been uh, stepping up. And in my opinion, uh, the way Carl Granderson has been playing off the edge, I would actually have him starting over Trey Hendrickson. Uh, Trey Hendrickson uh, has a lot of potential. Um, he's a guy that has a high motor. There were a lot of questions about him coming out of Florida Atlantic. I mean, he had a, a, bit, a real bad temper problem. Uh, that would, made him kind of drop in the draft. Uh, you know, a lot of teams didn't think that they can actually deal with his attitude. But he actually just turned around, man. He actually turned his life around. He's a, he's a good guy in the locker room. You don't really hear anything out of him. Uh, I just want to see more production on the field because the Saints are going to need him. They're going to need... Uh, to stop the run in order for them to win this football game against the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, another uh, person that needs to uh, step up, in my opinion, uh, it has to be when he comes back, I'm talking Marcus Williams. Uh, Marcus Williams started the season off really well. Um, he was he was a ball hawk, man. I mean, he had uh, a lot, you know, I think he had like four interceptions this season. Uh, you know, a couple plays that I've seen, you know, him – you know, make some really good uh, plays. He even had a pick six against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But I'm really concerned about the way that he's been tackling um, over the past couple weeks. Um, the game against the Tennessee Titans, uh, he ended up hurting himself in that game. Uh, that was a tackle that he, he could have had on A.J. Brown. No, not A.J., excuse me, on Corey Davis. And um, he ended up, like, going at his legs. You know, I feel like if you're a safety, you shouldn't have to be going at wide receivers' legs like that. I mean, I think that you should be able to lower the boom, also be able to wrap up and tackle. That's something that he struggles with. Um, yeah, I don't think uh, the way that he's been playing uh, for the last couple weeks, um, I would actually have him starting in this game. And I probably don't think the Saints will because he had a groin injury and he's been out for the past couple weeks. I think they're probably going to let uh, C.J. Gardner-Johnson or – uh, even let DJ Swearinger get in there for a little while to get the start. Uh, but whatever going on with Marcus Williams, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like uh, his confidence gets a little bit shocked. We've seen it in his rookie season and, and going into his sophomore year of the of the NFL season. Uh, he had five interceptions his rookie season. And then after that Minneapolis miracle, I mean, he just fell off. You know, like he just fell off. Uh, his, his sophomore season, I mean, he just wasn't really good. Um, I, I still feel in the NFC Championship game, uh, he had opportunity to jump in front of the tight end on that last drive um, against the Rams, but he didn't. You know, I think that he got scared, and the guy ended up getting like a 40-yard gain in that, on that play. So uh, I think Marcus Williams sometimes, like when he makes a mistake, he can't 
uh, get it out of his head. Uh, somebody that I have a lot of respect for is uh, C.J. Gardner-Johnson. I mean, he's a young rookie. He could have let that George Kittle uh, tackle that he missed um, actually affect his, his himself mentally, but he didn't. Um, he, he went out there and he balled out the very next week against the Indianapolis Colts, and he's been playing really good ever since. Um, I think Marcus Williams needs to uh, learn from C.J. Garner-Johnson to not allow uh, certain things to get into his head and affect the way that he plays. I mean, he's a young player right now. I think he has a, a, a you know, a, a high ceiling. Um, I know a lot of people in the Who That Nation, they get upset with Marcus Williams because, you know, of his tackling. But um, he reminds me of a lot of a young Malcolm Jenkins. I, I'd said that before, but he reminds me of a young Malcolm Jenkins. Malcolm Jenkins was one of those uh, safeties that uh, couldn't tackle. I mean, I remember uh, him getting beaten coverage. I remember him woofing on tackles and we were like, man, get him up out of here. But now you look at Malcolm Jenkins. I mean, he is a leader on the Philadelphia Eagles team. Uh, he's a guy who, who, who's a leader in the locker room and, he, he goes out there and he leads by example. I mean, despite what Orlando Skandrick actually said about him, I don't agree with what he said. You know, I feel like uh, Malcolm Jenkins is an incredible talent. Um, I think that he's a leader and he stepped up, you know, and he improved his play. And I feel like if the Saints were uh, to get rid of Marcus Williams, I think it would be a huge mistake. Um, even Sean Payton said it about Malcolm Jenkins. He said the biggest mistake he ever made um, or one of the biggest mistakes he made in his coaching career with the New Orleans Saints was the fact that he allowed Malcolm Jenkins to get out the door. That goes to so, show you how much respect Sean Payton has for Malcolm Jenkins and on um, what Malcolm Jenkins could have been uh, for the New Orleans Saints. But I, I like Marcus Williams. I just think that he just needs to uh, drown out the, the white noise, so to speak, and, and just go out there and play and, you know, don't let those mistakes affect you and, and the possible success that you can have. Uh, but also, let's move on to the wide receivers. Let's move to the wide receivers of the Minnesota Vikings. The Minnesota Vikings, they have really good wide receivers. Okay, of course, we got to talk about Stephon Diggs. At the beginning of the season, it wasn't a, a very happy marriage between uh, Kirk Cousins and, and uh, Stephon Diggs. Uh, Diggs is a guy who, you know, is is a, a, a yards after the catch type guy. He's elusive with the ball in his hands. And Kirk Cousins just couldn't give him the ball. Um, he, he couldn't give him the ball enough, and Stephon Diggs was really frustrated. He he wanted to uh, be traded. We heard the rumors, and a lot of people wanted me to talk about him possibly joining the Saints, which man, I, I would really love because I like Stephon Diggs. I mean, I know a lot of people in the Huda Nation don't like him because of how he made them feel in the divisional round, but if he can do that for the Saints, I wouldn't have any problem. Um, but it seems like they got on the same page. Uh, you know, it had a lot to do with Adam Thielen going down, missing uh, a, 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 a huge amount of games uh, due to the hamstring injury that he sustained uh, earlier in the season. But Stephon Diggs has really been stepping up. I mean, his his uh, catches have been uh, has increased. His touchdowns have increased since uh, he had that come to Jesus meeting uh, with Kirk Cousins and the offensive coordinator. And now we see this team actually clicking on all cylinders offensively, um, getting the ball down the field. Uh, I don't look at that Green Bay Packers game and just say, oh, man, these guys suck. Um, the Saints are going to have it easy. I just know what these guys can actually do. I've seen what the Minnesota Vikings wide receivers have done to the New Orleans Saints secondary. I mean, and it wasn't like the, the New Orleans Saints secondary wasn't having good coverage over these guys. I mean, Adam Thielen actually caught a pass behind – the, the head of Marshawn Lattimore. I mean, you couldn't get better coverage than what Lattimore was giving to Adam Thielen. It, it was just a better catch. I even seen in the preseason, I know, I know, we don't count preseason, but it is what it is. Uh, there was a pass down the field. Um, this guy is not going to play, but uh, Adam Thielen caught a pass over Eli Apple. And, um, you know, so these guys can catch the ball, man, and they, they make these circus-type catches. Um, Adam Thielen... Um, has been struggling this season, but it had a lot to do once again with the fact that he had a hamstring injury. And due to that hamstring injury, I mean, it, it enabled him to actually go out there and perform. He only been back for the for a couple weeks. Um, you know that he's going to play in this game. They're probably going to give him some of that uh, that liquid medicine, you know what I'm saying, that you inject inside your body to numb some of the pain and for him to go out there and try to play. 
Uh, I think that he's going to play much better. I think that each week he improves. Uh, you know, I think that he is going to be a guy uh, who they're going to count on. And that's why uh, New Orleans Saints secondary have, has got to be ready. And not to mention uh, Kyle Rudolph, uh, tight end uh, for the Minnesota Vikings, who is a good goal line threat. Um, every time, you know, they're down on, on in a red zone or, you know, goal line situation, he's a guy that they have to, de- they depend on. And, uh, they, they have a lot of guys, man. Irv Smith, man. I mean, he hasn't been making a lot of noise, but he has a, a, a lot of promise. So they have a lot of weapons on the offensive side of the ball for the Minnesota Vikings. And they, they get creative as well. I mean, I've seen a couple of plays, uh, you know, that were really creative uh, by them. Uh, there was a play that uh, Stephon Diggs was in the backfield and he was supposed to throw the ball to Kirk Cousins. Um, that pass ended up being incomplete. Uh, but... Kirk Cousins was wide open. It was just Stephon Diggs just missed him on the pass. So this is going to be interesting for the Saints, man. The Saints are going to have to buckle down and play really good defense. They're going to be have to play really disciplined. And they can't make any mistakes, man, because uh, they, they can. Uh, the Minnesota Vikings can uh, generate turnovers, man. They can, they can get that ball. Uh, the secondary of the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, the secondary, very questionable. Uh, Trey Wiggs. Uh, has been playing uh, average. And somebody that has been a big disappointment is Xavier Rhodes. Now, I was going at it uh, with, a, with a fan of the Minnesota Vikings. He was talking about how Xavier Rhodes was going to clamp down on Michael Thomas. And I thought that was laughable. <laughs> I thought it was laughable because Xavier Rhodes has been stinking it up all season long. Uh, according to Pro Football Focus, um, I think – he has been targeted 60 times in a, you know, as a cornerback quarterbacks have thrown the ball at him 60 times, 48 times the receiver has caught the ball over him. Um, You know, that goes to show you how this guy has fell off. I don't know if he's injured. I don't know if, you know, I don't know all those injuries that he may sustain uh, throughout his career is catching up to him. I don't know what's going on. But Xavier Rose has really regressed, and I really like the matchup between him and Michael Thomas. I mean, he's a physical cornerback, but Xavier Rose, uh, his his recovery speed has has really diminished, man. Like he used to have really really good recovery speed, but now it's like, I mean, receivers can get past him. I mean, Devontae Adams was actually doing this guy dirty in that game against the Green Bay Packers. I mean, it was it was horrible. Uh, Xavier Rhodes, uh, he's going to have a, a lot of trouble with Michael Thomas, in my opinion. Um, I think they're going to give him some help. Of course, I think that the Minnesota Vikings are going to come into this game uh, saying that I am not going to allow your best wide receiver to beat us. So I, I look for the Minnesota Vikings to uh, do a lot of double covering on, on Michael Thomas. I look for a lot of double coverage. I look for a lot of safeties over the top. Um, I, I look for these guys to really try to take – Michael Thomas out of the game, try to be physical with him, try to bump him at the line of scrimmage. Uh, but, so they're going to really try to uh, work so Michael Thomas won't be fully involved in this game. So it's going to take a lot of the wide receivers for the Saints to step up and, and really play to the best of their ability. I, one thing that I liked about the Carolina Panthers game was the fact that Michael Thomas wasn't fully involved in this game. I mean, I was glad that the Carolina Panthers actually double covered him the way that they did because it, it made other receivers step up, like Traquan Smith. I mean, I can't remember the last time I looked at the box scores or looked at the stats, and Traquan Smith was the leading receiver uh, for the New Orleans Saints in the game. I mean, you have to go back to that Philadelphia Eagles game last season when he led the, teams in, in, the team in receptions. So, I mean, he's going to have to step up because I'm pretty sure they're going to try to double cover Michael Thomas every time they get an opportunity to, to do so. But if it's a one-on-one matchup, I like Michael Thomas' chances all the way. Michael Thomas actually played really well against Xavier Rhodes in the in the uh, first game that they played in the divisional round. I mean, Michael Thomas had two touchdowns in that game. So it wasn't like he was out there just doing, you know, Michael Thomas dirty and he was just locking him down. Michael Thomas was getting the best of Xavier Rhodes in that game. Uh, so the Saints really are going to have to find ways to try to get other players involved. I mean, I like the emergence of Jerry Cook over the past couple of weeks. He's been playing out his mind. Um, I like Alvin Kamara has been running really well. 
Um, and also, I think Latavius Murray, he's going to be motivated for this game. I mean, the Minnesota Vikings were his team last season. I mean, they allowed you to get up out the door. So um, you know that he's going to take that very personally every time he runs the football. And I like Latavius Murray, man. I think he's a, a, a very physical back. I think that he's a guy that that really uh, shows up when you need him to show up. He's a dependable running back. Uh, when Alvin Kamara was down earlier in the season, Latavius Murray was on a whole nother level. Um, he really did a good job against the Chicago Bears, and he really did a good job against the Arizona Cardinals. Those are two memorable games I can remember that Latavius Murray ran really well. Uh, but Alvin Kamara, you know, he's been doing much better. It seems like he, he is improving. Uh, it seems like his health is improving. So that's just, just what the doctor ordered uh, going into this postseason. <laughs> um, but those are a couple things, you know, about this game, you know, that are very intriguing. Of course, um, I'm going to uh, do a live, uh, you know, prediction show. I do it every Saturday. Uh, I do a prediction show live on YouTube. And I talk about who I feel like is going to win this game, what's going to be the score. Um, so if you do not follow me on YouTube, please do. YouTube.com, search State of the Saints Podcast. We're going to shift gears now. Um, we're going to talk about uh, Antonio Brown uh, once again. Um, I got to talk about Antonio Brown because uh, somebody asked me to. Um, I'm kind of off the Antonio Brown train. Um, I really uh, didn't want to discuss him. Um, because of his antics over the past uh, couple of uh, days. Um, very, very disturbing type rhetoric that's coming out of the camp of Antonio Brown, man. I mean, just, dude just on a whole different level right now. And I'm not even talking about in a good way. I'm talking about a horrible, dark, demented way. Um, this guy, for some apparent reason, uh, just thinks that the world revolves around him. Um, it's sad to actually see a guy who has a bunch of potential just squander it because he can't get out of his own way. Um, I, I seen his uh, Instagram live. Um, he was walking on a treadmill. I guess that was his T.O. moment. Um, if you remember a couple of years back, T.O. was sent home, I think, by the, I don't know if it was the Cowboys or the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, but he was doing push-ups in the driveway. And... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, he was talking to the media, doing push-ups, talking about how he stays ready. Uh, I think we all remember that. I mean, if you're, if you're old enough. Um, that was kind of what Antonio Brown was doing. He was on his treadmill, and, you know, I guess that was his mountaintop. And talking about uh, the New Orleans Saints organization, he he know that Sean Payton uh, saw the tape. He liked what he saw on tape, but, you know, it was the Saints' loss, and the Saints used him as a publicity stunt. And I thought that was funny because why would a team that's 13 and three uh, need a egotistical wide receiver to actually get some news or some buzz or some clicks? Uh, the New Orleans Saints for the past couple of weeks have players that have been on uh, record setting paces, have broken records. Uh, the Saints have one of the best, the best records in the National Football League, but he feels like the Saints actually need him to come in in order for them to get buzz. That's the dumbest thing that I ever heard in my entire life. And that's one of the main reasons why I've been telling people for weeks that I didn't want this guy nowhere around the New Orleans Saints organization. And people were like, well, TJ, you know, this is not a, a, a popularity contest. If he can go in here and, and, and he can help us win, then I don't care. I, I, I think people are missing the point. The point is that Antonio Brown is a team killer. I don't think people understand that these teams don't just get together on Sunday. They don't just get together on Sunday and just say, okay, man, let's play some ball. Now, we probably have friends like that, right? Like, we don't see each other for a whole week. But we probably get together and go out there and throw the ball around and play a little pitch up tackle or a little throw around, a little team football. But NFL doesn't work like that. These guys are around each other every single day. Okay? They're in the locker rooms together. They're in team meetings together. You know, they they 
Some of them probably hang out at each other's house. They work out together, you know. So there's so much going on, you know, that just doesn't involve just playing on a football field. It's about going out there and executing, of course, but you have to be in meetings. You have to show yourself as being a loyal and dependable teammate. And I don't think that this guy has it in him to show anybody that. I mean, he hasn't shown any of that over the past couple of years. And that's one of the main reasons why I did not want him in the Saints organization. And I'm glad that the Saints decided to go in a different direction. And I'm glad that they did go in a different direction. I, I really am, man, because um, I think that uh, Antonio Brown is a team killer once again. And I, I didn't want him in the organization, but they decided to go get Tim White. Uh, Tim White is a 25-year-old wide receiver. He's 5'10", 175 pounds. Um, he, he comes out of Arizona State. He was undrafted back in 2017. So, um, looks like one of those guys that's kind of similar to a uh, Deontay Harris. I'm thinking that the New Orleans Saints are probably going to try to use him in ways that they want to use Deontay Harris. Probably how they used Tommy Lee Lewis last season. Um I don't know if he's on the practice squad or not. I think I heard some um, I heard some news about him possibly being on the practice squad, but the guy not a household name. Um, he played for the Baltimore Ravens, and uh, you know I'm I'm just excited about that. You know because Antonio Brown is talented as he is. Um, I just think that the Saints did better just not getting him in that locker room, man. I mean you have a lot of young impressionable players on the Saints team. And you also have a lot of uh, t- players that are not selfish on the Saints team. These guys aren't selfish at all. I mean, they, they play together. I mean, if you look at these guys on social media, you know, they encourage each other. You know, they, you know if one of them uh, has an accomplishment or something like that, you know, the other one is retweeting or reposting uh, some of the good, uh, you know, the good news and the good tweets that people are saying about them. So they're encouraging one another. And, and you see things on the sidelines in games when guys make mistakes. You see other guys over there, you know, encouraging them, saying, we're going to need you down the stretch. I don't think you'll see any of that out of Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown uh, is a guy who, who wants the ball all the time just so the spotlight can be on him. And I find it funny that he said that this was a publicity stunt for the Saints, but in reality it was a publicity stunt for himself uh, because he actually – you know, capitalized on that. He was empowered uh, by the fact that the Saints actually brought him in for a workout because nobody was thinking about no Antonio Brown. I mean, nobody was. Nobody was thinking about him. I mean, he had his little 15 minutes in the news because of all the stuff with his foot and, you know, his, his controversial comments, you know, towards the Steelers and Ben Roethlisberger and not wanting to go play for the Oakland Raiders and, and you know, his, his game – uh, with the New England Patriots. I mean, we've seen all that, but, uh, I mean, nobody was thinking about him after he left the Patriots. I mean, they, they we understood why they decided to cut him, and that was it. But so the Saints brought him in for a workout, and that just put all the attention back on him. So right now, he is on his mountaintop and talking, and he's trying to get everything he possibly can out before people actually forget about him all over again. So he's the one that's actually capitalizing on it, not the Saints, because the Saints have a game this weekend against the Minnesota Vikings, and he doesn't have a team to even have a game on. You know what I'm saying? So the thing about it is Antonio Brown really has to do some soul searching. This guy has to search inside himself before he gets on anybody's field. Um, It it just seems like to me that he just obsessed uh, with the spotlight, man. I mean, I've never seen, you know, such a, a narcissistic, individual in my life you know like the only person i can just think of that just so into themselves like that was david ruffin you know (laughs) of the temptations you know like you see in that movie you know ain't nobody coming to see you otis you know like if you seen the temptation movie but (laughs) i never seen anybody just so into themselves like he is man I, i i just don't i just don't get it man but he just needs some help uh he needs uh some real I'm talking about some real legit friends around him, not just a bunch of yes men that just are afraid to lose out because he has a whole bunch of money and they can possibly, uh, you know, lose out on the wine, women and song. Somebody got to save this man from himself because he's not going to do it. 
But I mean, it it just said that he is wasting his his Hall of Fame potential, and um, you know, I mean, eventually, you know, the way that he's living, he's going to run out of money, and it's going to be sad that you're going to burn all the bridges down, and then you're going to wake up and be too old to play in the National uh, Football League again, and teams are going to be able to pass up on you because they're going to look at your age and and your talent is not going to be able to uh, help you anymore. So this guy really needs some help, man. He's going to have to uh, really wake up and and realize that, you know, the way that he's living, I mean, he's going, man, he's going down. I mean, he's a heck of a talent, which makes this all sad, but, I mean, it's not going to end well. But I, I did ask for you, the Houdat Nation, to send in questions uh, that you had about the New Orleans Saints. So I'm going to uh, read some of the questions and thank you once again for you know chiming in. Rather, you uh, em- emailed me at uh, state of the saints at gmail dot com or you you know hit me up on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, so uh, the first question is: This comes from uh, Simba. Simba says. What player or position should the Saints focus on in this upcoming 2020 draft? Can you see Taysom as an elite quarterback, number one for the Saints, or has he reached uh, his ceiling in the role he played? Uh, thank you very much, Simba. That's that's two really good questions right here. The first question, uh, what uh, direction do I think the Saints need to go in in the 2020 draft? Uh, I think that the Saints need to go and get a wide receiver. Um, they need a true number two wide receiver. We've been having this conversation uh, for all season long, um, who was the number two outside of Michael Thomas. And I think the Saints need to go out and try to get themselves a, a true number two receiver. Um, I don't think that you're going to get anybody like Judy or C.D. Lamb, uh, you know, two good ri- wide receivers. I think these guys are going to be gone by the time the Saints um, actually get a pick. But there are good quality receivers inside of this year's draft that that, that can come in and can be true number twos. Um, you know, there are several guys that, you know, that I look at, um, you know, that I feel like will be able to contribute to the team. Uh, but uh, I think that the Saints need to go out here and get a true number two uh, because um, as I like Traquan Smith, but I don't think that he is a number two receiver. He's more like a number three. Um, and, and, you know, I feel like if the Saints can kind of use him, he can be similar to that of a Lance Moore, but I don't think they can use him like that because they don't have a number two. Uh, so I think they need to look at wide receivers. Um, also, I think that they need, need to also look at somebody else uh, that can be a possible, uh, you know, a linebacker. You know, I, I think they need a linebacker, a guy that can actually uh, cover the running backs and also that is a short tackler. Those are two positions I feel like the Saints uh, really need to look at. And as far as Taysom Hill, um, Taysom Hill uh, has a very high ceiling. Um, we know that he can do a lot of things. He is a true Swiss Army knife. I mean, this guy can do anything that you ask him to do. He's improved in the passing game. His hands has, has gotten better. Um, the way that he's throwing the ball down the field when the Saints ask him to throw the ball, I mean, he's really accurate. He throw, throws it on time. Um, do I think that he can be an elite quarterback? Um, that remains to be seen. Um, I think that he he has the, the, you know, the ability to actually be a good quarterback. Um, I, but great, that remains to be seen. Uh, but I do think that the Saints can use him uh, in the future. Uh, if Teddy Bridgewater decides to go to another team and, um, you know, take the money, uh, maybe possibly playing for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers or something like that, if they don't bring Jameis Winston back, uh, Taysom Hill can possibly be, you know, a good quality starter if Drew Brees decides to hang it up. And maybe the Saints can cr- probably try to draft a quarterback, you know, in this year's draft. Thank you very much for your question. The next one comes from Michael. Michael says, can we keep Teddy Bridgewater? I believe he will do great things for us with Sean Payton as his coach. Uh, Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Do I think we can keep Teddy Bridgewater? The answer is yes. Uh, With the salary cap uh, going up to $200 million next season, I think the Saints can keep him. Uh, The question is, uh, will the Saints have enough money to keep him? Um, the thing about Teddy Bridgewater is um, he actually played himself out of New Orleans, in my opinion. Um, I, I keep saying that. I've said that several times. But he has actually played himself out of New Orleans, and he's played himself into a lot of money. Um, the thing about it is, I mean, he went 5-0 and as a starter for the New Orleans Saints. So when a team actually is evaluating uh, in the offseason and looking at their players and, 
and seeing who they can possibly bring in to make their team better. You know teams are going to be looking at Teddy Bridgewater because of his success. But I will say this, uh, Teddy Bridgewater has to be really careful at the team that he goes to. If he goes out there just chasing money, um, he's going to be one of those guys that can be the yeah, but guy. He That's, that's what he's going to be. Um, I feel like he is uh, more of a system quarterback. Um, I feel like if he gets into a good system like the New Orleans Saints have, uh, he has a lot of potential. But I feel like if he goes, he just goes to a team that is bad and he's just chasing money, I think he is going to seriously damage his career. Um, this right now is a, a, a great opportunity for Teddy Bridgewater uh, to go out there and actually submit his legacy. It all depends on what he is going to do uh, to actually, you know, cement his legacy. Is he going to go out there and he's going to chase that money and chase that almighty dollar? And, I mean, it's very tempting. I mean, when teams dangle a carrot of 35 to possibly $40 million in your face, I mean, it's hard for you to turn that down, right? <laughs> I mean, we want to want to turn that down. I mean, so no matter how bad the team is, you still want that money. But um, Teddy Bridgewater has shown that he wants to be in New Orleans. I mean, he had an opportunity to go play for the Miami Dolphins. He had an opportunity to be a starter. I mean, everything was working out for him. The stars were aligned. Going to a the hometown team, the Miami Dolphins. He grew up in Florida, close to Miami. So it would have been a dream come true. So that goes to show you right there that this guy wants to be great. Uh, he wants to uh, maximize his potential. And he understood that being a quarterback of the New Orleans Saints, learning under Drew Brees, uh, having Sean Payton as his coach, uh, he can really uh, make some noise and possibly be a really good quarterback. So um, I think the Saints going to want to keep him. Um, I think that that was their intentions the whole entire time. I think that he was – supposed to be the successor to drew Brees. um a couple things that actually uh proved that to be true um number one was in the off season uh teddy bridgewater's agent uh came out and said that he was concerned that sean payton would not come back to new orleans if he was to sign a contract uh with the new orleans saints in the you know the, the following season but the question was why should that matter i mean you have a one-year contract so if you're not thinking about possibly coming back the following season after you after your one year contract uh why does it matter if Sean Payton goes anywhere it doesn't matter where he goes you're not going to be with the Saints right so th that says to me that somebody told Teddy Bridgewater that uh Drew Brees uh, window was closing and he was up next I, I I just don't believe that there there is no way that I believe that a guy is going to have an opportunity to be a starter in the National Football League to start for his very own franchise to be the franchise quarterback and turns that down to be a backup uh, and play for a team. Uh, you know, if somebody didn't promise him that he can possibly be uh, the successor to that quarterback, I, I just don't believe that. So I feel like that's what happened with Teddy Bridgewater, but I don't think the saints actually thought that he was actually going to play. So nobody will actually see him play. And, but the problem was he went five and O oh, and teams are going to be chomping at the bit to sit down with, uh, Teddy Bridgewater's representation and, and try to, uh, you know, get him to uh, come to their team. But thank you very much, Mike. And thank you, Who That Nation, for submitting your questions. Uh, once again, you can do so. You can go to Facebook.com, search State of the Saints podcast, and you can inbox your questions there. Or you can uh, email me at State of the Saints at gmail.com and you can submit your questions there. This has been the State of the Saints podcast. Thank you very much for checking out the podcast. I appreciate that. Uh, check out the State of the Saints podcast on YouTube. YouTube.com, search State of the Saints podcast. Facebook.com, search State of the Saints podcast. And um, thank you very much for checking out this audio version of the State of the Saints podcast. And hopefully we have very much to talk about uh, as the Saints take on the Minnesota Vikings. Hopefully we'll be talking about the Saints going on the road to Lambeau to take on the Green Bay Packers in the divisional round. Till next time, all I got to say is, who that? <laughs>